All right, so we are headed into the home stretch. We are two weeks away from being done and we just concluded our week here at Capernaum. Now I've talked about how being back here has been a bit of a surreal experience. It's like when you go back to kindergarten and you say, gosh, this looks so much smaller than I remember it. Uh, but I like it. I love the, I have very fond memories of it. And that's what it's been like being here in Capernaum uh, in these studios. Now, a lot of what we've captured over the last few days has centered around two main Pharisees, Shmuel and Yanni. Yanni is one of our new uh, characters this season who are trying to convince people higher than them on the totem pole that Jesus is a threat. Blatantly commanding someone to violate Shabbat in addition to blasphemy. President Shimon would call that a thin case. So when we write, we think about the fact that by season six, we know that the Pharisees will have captured Jesus. And of course, we know what happens to Jesus. But we want to work our way backwards and set up. When did this start? When did the Pharisees start to really be threatened by him? And what were they doing? By whose authority do you teach? And we feel like through a lot of the research we've done that they were pretty upset with him early on. But it was difficult to convince other Pharisees outside of some of his areas where he specifically was teaching that he was a threat. There had been plenty of preachers who were problematic, including John the Baptist. But it wasn't easy to convince people outside of Capernaum, outside of some of these core places where Jesus started his ministry, that this guy was an abnormal threat. All I can tell you is that a very prominent member of the Sanhedrin declared that the one-off incident by a rogue who posed no material threat. And Shmuel sees pretty early on that there's a problem here. And so he and Yanni, uh, having experienced the healing at the pool, having experienced the healings from season one, where he was, where he healed the leper, where he healed the, the, the paralytic through the roof, and that he was claiming authority to forgive sins. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or rise up and walk. Claiming authority over Shabbat, over that Shabbat period where there's no work to be done, Jesus has now multiple times performed a miracle or done work that many considered blasphemous. And so now the word is starting to spread, not only among Shmuel and Yanni, but they are taking this to the higher ups in Jerusalem. This last few days, we filmed scenes of them planning on what they were going to do. We've seen scenes of them writing letters uh, to these higher ups. We've seen scenes of them getting frustrated that they're not being heard. And then we finally shot a scene where they meet with Shammai. Now Shammai was one of the top rabbis of the entire Pharisee order back in those days. There were two schools of thought, Shammai and Hillel. And the house of Shammai was very rigid. And the house of Hillel was more like about you know, connecting with the people. So they were a little bit more favorable towards Jesus, um, or at least not resistant to some of his teachings, whereas Shammai's house was completely resistant to it because they were extremely rigid, extremely focused on following every single law to the T. And that's who ultimately Shmuel and Yanni find favor with. These scenes are, to me are like some of those political shows or shows where you're seeing some of the inner workings, uh, the backdoor dealings, uh, the kind of stuff you don't normally see in Bible shows. When the court splits along Mishnaic traditions, it becomes political. Former allies become enemies. We had a full day of Simon Z. Simon Z, uh, Simon the Zealot, uh, is one of the 12 disciples. And so we see what caused him to pursue Jesus and ultimately for Jesus to call him. And so we did a whole day where we were out in the fields of the Capernaum village where we're filming. And uh, you see Simon Z camping and preparing. And at one point, you know, because he's a zealot, he was highly trained as a murderer. And so we see some of his training methods uh, while he's camping, uh, some of his warm up routines in the morning. And so we actually had a lot of fun with that. And our actor, Allah, is actually a very experienced martial artist and stunt person. So he's actually done a lot of this stuff before. So it was really cool to kind of explore this character that I don't think I've ever seen in a Bible movie or show before, uh, where we really get to see his backstory. And we're also seeing Atticus, the Roman, follow him. And uh, he's on the trail. And so you've got a, a Roman who's following this guy, expecting a zealot to be a murderer, uh, because zealots were not only murderers of Romans, but they were murderers of any Jews that they considered to be traitors. So Atticus is following him because Atticus finds him to be a threat. 
But Simon Z isn't really acting like a threat uh, because he's pursuing Jesus. And so this is the beginning of our recognition that the Romans were starting to wonder who Jesus was. And so we explore that here in season two. I've got news. It's about Jesus of Nazareth. Then we had this big scene where we saw a murder training. So this is where uh, the zealots are actually practicing the assassination that comes at the end of episode four. And while we were doing that, part of the assassination attempt and the rehearsal was lighting a little bit of a fire. Well, that little bit of a fire when we lit it, uh, because it was a drier day, because there was hay in this thing, it ended up becoming uh, a little bit longer than we expected. Action! Fire! No, 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 no. I can't do that, Chris. All right, that's way too big. All right. The fire starts to build and we put it out and then it keeps coming and it gets caught to the burlap. So we were never in danger. Um, our special effects team is extraordinarily uh, competent and uh, also we have safety measures in place so that if anything does come out of control, we know how to clear the area and help out. But this thing just wouldn't stop. But it was quite, a, quite an adventure for about 10, 15 minutes as we tried to put this thing on it. But it actually looked quite cool. Uh, and then today was one of my favorite days of filming in the entire Chosen, uh, which is where we see the glimpses of the disciples seven, eight, maybe 10 years from Jesus' death. The scene that we filmed today was one of those moments, one of the, I think, one of the great moments of my career where I really knew this was gonna work. Um, the idea was great. Um, one of my co-writers, uh, Tyler, actually came up with the concept of flashing forward, um, you know, six, seven years uh, for the opening of season two. Then I started to think, well, why are all these disciples together? Like, how did John assemble all these disciples to interview them? And if they're all missionaries, why are they together? And I thought, what if they came together for a funeral? You know, what if they came together because one of them died? And so I ended, ended up looking up in the research, and of course it was Big James, who was the first disciple who was martyred. And then immediately I knew that the scene could have an even more emotional weight, that this is what would cause John to feel so frantic to start getting notes and start talking to the other disciples to get their stories. And it's also a reason why he might not want to focus on his brother's death. This is a way for him to overcome the pain that he's feeling is to start thinking about the writing. And that's sometimes what we do in modern day, in real life, where when we're experiencing a tragedy, sometimes we try to distract ourselves to not deal with the pain of it. And so John is trying to deal with the pain of this by writing about the life of Jesus. And so he's interviewing all the actors. And then of course, I realized, well, the conversation that he can be having about his, some of his memories could be with Mother Mary. And we know at the, at the crucifixion that Jesus said to John, John, this is now your mother, and mother, this is now your son. And so we were able to play with that a little bit about seeing John call Mary his mother and Mary call John her son and to see them interact. Um, and we just knew that opening season two with this moment would immediately cause the audience to be like, what are we seeing? What are we looking at? Why does, uh, why does Simon look older? Why is he looking into the camera? This is so unique and strange. And then when they start to realize what's happening and that this is a flash forward, we just really knew that this was going to work and be a great way to open the season. So today when we filmed it, and I'm seeing the actors come down in their older age makeup and it doesn't look silly, you know, it looks realistic. And even the actors were experiencing this Oh my goodness, this is really intense. The older you make me, the more I feel, want to feel that way, looking into the mirror. I feel tired. And it was a really powerful, emotional day. I mean, a lot of the actors were having a hard time even keeping it together because they were able to put themselves in the shoes or in the sandals of these followers of Jesus. And what would their lives be like five years later and remembering what it was like when he died and mourning even the loss of one of their own, one of their brothers. Uh, so seeing the makeup happen, you know, uh, seeing the hair happen, all of that stuff, the whole day was about logistics and trying to make sure that it looked right, but we couldn't let that get in the way of the emotional impact of what was happening. And so the actors were so present and so on point, it was really beautiful to watch and the cinematography, I mean, Akis' work in, in the lighting of it. Everything just came together, and I think it's gonna prove to be one of my favorite memories of this show, is doing this scene. And I think a lot of the crew felt that too. We just felt like 
this is a special scene and it looks beautiful and the actors are beautiful and the, the writing just really worked. We just knew that it was really a, a really great opportunity to recreate something that has never been recreated on film that we thought could really be powerful. And so I think years from now, this scene will be looked at as uh, one of the signature scenes of The Chosen. Boy, I cannot wait to, until you see it. By the time you're watching this, you will probably have already seen this scene, and so hopefully you'll get a glimpse of what it looks like. But this has been a fun week at Capernaum. It's, where it's been great to be back, and uh, two weeks left until we are finished filming, and I cannot wait uh, to get into the editing process to get this show to you. Hey there, it's Dallas, I'm the creator of The Chosen. Would you mind doing me a favor? Just real quick, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell. It really helps our channel get out in front of more people. Thank you so much.